I, today we're really um, fortunate to have um, well two two good friends um, of uh, of us and of, of of architecture and of education, um, Irene Scalbert and uh, Professor John Toomey, uh, joining us for a conversation. And I think um, this kind of came about because, as you said, this is a you know the Zoom uh, cast is about creating discussion between schools of architecture. And, um, you know, I kind of thought that this would be a, an opportunity to kind of maybe clash heads isn't quite the right word, but um, at least to kind of put something on the table, um, as Irene likes to say, um, and discuss it. Um, and I think that, um, well, first of all, I'd really like to thank Irene for, uh, for proposing this and, and, and to thank uh, John for, um, for, for joining in a kind of rebuttal. And uh, I, I think it's going to produce a really uh, interesting discussion and I look forward to it. Um, so Irene, I'll leave it to you to put something on the table um, as you're so good at doing um, and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me get my files together. Now, I, I have written an essay, in fact, a book, none of which have been published yet uh, recently on the work of Neutling Swedeik. And as I was saying earlier, neither of which have yet been published, so one imminently. Uh, and I thought it would be useful, A, to, to put very briefly what some ideas in this essay and book uh, are, and also on the assumption that not everybody will know the work of Neutling Swedeik, and also for the benefit of the discussion to actually uh, show some of their work. So at least there are points of references. Now, the, the first thing I would say is that um, there is one issue in the background which does interest me and which is the uh, relationship between form, architectural form, and identification. And here, of course, as you recognize, it's a model of, of the Kathleen Tower and with workers in uh, the Soviet Union. Um, the, there has been actually a very long uh, tradition, at least in the 20th century, but one could argue longer about the relationship between architecture and sculpture. Uh, this is perhaps, you know, one of the most explicit examples of that kind by André Bloch in uh, France, uh, that was in the uh, late 60s when Bloch was doing so-called inhabitable sculptures. Um, and the idea in all this is that uh, sculptures become a means for identification. Uh, here is another example, uh, much better known, of course, and this is Le Corbusier's uh, church at Firmini. Uh, a building I have visited, I think very striking from the outside, uh, also actually equally striking from the inside, uh, acoustics, which to put it politely, are, are exceptionally strange. Um, and um, this also is an example in my mind of what Le Corbusier meant by architecture is a magnificent play of volumes. Uh, brought together in the light. Uh, I must say, I find this definition, well, first it's very old, it's also uh, a bit vapid in my view, uh, and perhaps there can be more discussion about this uh, later on. Another thing which is worth bearing in mind is that um, Le Corbusier, as many of you, all of you probably know, work also as a sculpture. This is the so-called main ouverte, the open hand, which Le Corbusier designed and then gifted to the city of Chandigarh. And uh, I do find this idea that architects work more often as painters, but also as sculptors, I think relevant to this discussion. 
Now, coming to the subject, or one of the subject of today, perhaps, uh, this is a building by Neutling 3 uh, an office based in the Netherlands. Uh, they emerged in the early 1990s. Um, and I personally, my, my interest in their work as I was, I suppose, discovering that for that they were genuine architects. And um, they describe their buildings as sculptures in the city. Here is a competition for a concert hall in the city of Bruges. Um, and so why present at this stage the work of uh, Neutling Sredaik? I mean, one of the reasons is that their work has been, I think, not completely ignored, but has been by and large under the radar. I think in some ways it's not unfair to say that it has been ignored and even time despised. Uh, in my view, they are unequivocally the best designers in Dutch architecture among that generation which emerged in the 1990s. Um, now, as I said, I wrote an essay, two essays, in fact, one uh, is about to come out. And interestingly, this issue of OASA is entitled uh, underrated and overrated architects. And uh, I did not tell you uh, what is my opinion in that sense. I think they are underrated. Now, looking at this project in more detail, it was usually, it was usually controversial, as you can imagine. Uh, they, of course, lost the competition. Uh, but what interests me perhaps is a comparison between this project and the open hands by Le Corbusier. This maybe is a hand it's ways it is uh, in fact not quite a hand, it is more like a fist, and it is a fist which was raised in protest against the force of conservatism and also against uh, uh, ordinary architectural conventions. Um, it should be added that also the form is not explicitly symbolic and certainly not in the way most buildings which are sculptural by Le Corbusier uh, tend to be. And also I mean, there is something about this which is interesting. Now, this building by Neutling Sredaik is perhaps, in my view, uh, the one I prefer and perhaps their uh, best. It's a college of transport and shipping in Rotterdam. Uh, and it has uh, a quality which has been pointed out by a number of people, one of which is that it has an animal-like character. Um, even the architects have talked in their writings about their buildings having heads, snouts, and tails, and other aspects belonging to animals. Um, here is the heads, uh, and perhaps also the snout, but there is another snout here, and perhaps here is the tail. Um, I find those buildings uh, highly evocative and have sometimes uh, very appropriate, uh, that is the form has very appropriate sighting uh, in, the, in the city. And the expressiveness of this building also I find interesting. I think it has a kind of elephantine um, nonchalance. Uh, which is there quite often in their work. And if you actually go inside the building, as I said, it's, it is a college. Um, and this the head, inside the head, you have uh, uh, the main lecture hall. And the main lecture hall has walls 
of so-called elephantine skin. It's not, it is a kind of trade terms. And also I was struck by the seeds also having a texture which reminded me perhaps even more explicitly uh, of elephant skins. So again, this animal side to it. Uh, see, and on the left, needless to say, you have this extraordinary view of the harbor. Um, and looking at, at the back, uh, here is a view of the tail. I find personally the cladding very interesting, but that's maybe a detail and you did not get into this. Now, this building you will know very well. I, I am myself very familiar with it because I have written at length about it. Um, and I think the comparison with the work of Sterling and Gowan and later Sterling uh, is an interesting one uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, Sterling uh, made, made buildings uh, which in some ways privileged a solid character. Another aspect is it's a very sophisticated expressive modeling of the building and there is a taste for cantilevers which has often been pointed out as far as this building is concerned and also the architect and in particular Sterling uh, has an, a reputation as being a uh, enfant terrible. Now all those four characteristics, I think, can be actually um, um, applied to the work and, shall I say, also the character of the architects, uh, both Willem Jan Neutlings and Michael Riedijk. Now, there is, I think, one distinction and which is that I regard uh, this building, which as I said, I, I know rather well, uh, as perhaps the first iconic building. And there is in this building, which I still like, uh, an aspect which I, was which I would regard as uh, a fetish. There is something which I think is uh, fetishistic in the sense that it is the architect who were uh, very, very keen and perhaps obsessed with uh, their own work, with this project as it was uh, in progress, and then taking lots and lots and lots of photographs of it. Now, so one difference, I think, with the work of Neutlings is that uh, Neutlings I think the work is less a fetish than it is a totem. And there is a difference which has been made by an anthropologist between the fetish as being a, a personal, um, I mean, ob an object which has a personal relationship to the person who has it, while a totem is aimed explicitly uh, towards uh, a larger public towards a collective of some sort. This distinction incidentally has been made by an anthropologist called James Fraser. Now, the other thing which I think could be said about uh, this, this building is that it has animistic qualities. Uh, it suggests that um, uh, a building like uh, uh, a plant or an animal has a capacity to uh, communicate. And here is an example from, this is, um, I used to be famous, I don't know whether people still talk about it, but this is a totem from the Tinglit tribe in New Colombia, which was stolen by uh, the people from, some people from Seattle and then transported in the main square of Seattle and erected in the middle of the square. And actually it is still there. Now, interestingly, so it's, here you have uh, a totem in the middle of the city. 
and very much like uh, Neutling's Redirect wanted to do, which was to have um, a totem sculpture in the city, their, their expression. Um, so one thing in common is, uh, as I have already mentioned uh, in the context of Neutling's Redirect's office, it has elements such as beak, win, wings, and fins, and clothes, and much else. Uh, in other words, uh, animal-like quality. And this actually remind, reminded me that animism, uh, in other words, a form of cult, uh, has been in the air in the recent past, partly because many people in the wake of an, a number of writers, for instance, Bruno Latour, uh, have started to call about speciesism. In other words, uh, see, uh, it's a form of racism, I suppose, which is uh, manifest at the expense of animal and plants. This is part of a very, I suppose, recent um, discourse. And so the, the possibility which, in my mind, this picture expresses and the building, uh, the design we have just shown, is that there might be a possibility to actually converse with buildings in a way which is in comparable at least in some respects to the way we communicate, we would like to communicate, should I say, with animals and plants. Now, uh, I, this, all this led me to look a bit in what had been written and said about uh, so-called primitive culture, and in particular, African sculpture. And um, in my evaluation, the best book on African culture remains a rather small book written very early on by a man called Karl Einstein, not the Einstein of E equal MC square, but another one. Um, and in this book, Einstein um, tries to identify specific uh, characteristic of uh, African sculptures, uh, some of which might be that it has a kind of power, and architects often talk about the power of a building, and it is a notion which is used in a very vague sense, and I think it would merit further exploration. Einstein talks about these buildings being distant, pe uh, keeping people at bay. And then he uses uh, a specific expression, which I have mentioned, and which are, in my view, still, which are evocative without being explicit. One is formal realism, and the other one is total form. And we might uh, come back to this uh, maybe later in the conversation. Now, I now will show you, uh, I think, four buildings, um, just very briefly designed by the office. So we have at least a few examples um, on the table. Um, this is a cultural center built by the office in uh, the center of the Netherlands in Amersfoort. And I think John entered um, competition to build housing on that very same square. Uh, during a period of about seven years, uh, sorry, uh, of 10 years, Neutling's Redyk design seven major public buildings uh, in the Netherlands, uh, all of which have been built. Quite an extraordinary uh, achievement. And the project I was showing earlier on, the competition project for the concert hall in Bruges, uh, 
has a figure of ancestor in that series. In other words, all the major building which came afterwards, in a way, learned from that initial experience. Um, now, in the case of this project, which is a library here, and there is a music uh, uh, center on the lower floor and a dance school on the upper floor. Uh, the architects were, I think, impatient with the master plan, which had been drawn from this square. And for them, the master plan meant something to do with the kivitas. In other words, what architects have become rather formed in the last 30 years, 40 years, which is the public um, and civic dimensions of the city and specifically of its squares. And I point this out to say that actually Neutling's Redikes are less interested in the civic characters of space and they are interested in the popular character. In other words, they are more interested in the populace than they are in Kivitas. Now, having said what I have said, you might think that their work is all about exteriors. Well, no. This is, if you enter through a door which is a little bit further, the main door of the building, a little bit further on the right, you enter in uh, the library and so the library uh, fill most of the middle zone as a, as a complex open space and I think one way of looking at the architect's approach to internal space is just like says the architects look at buildings in terms of bodies they also uh, look at internal space in, as organs, as organs of sorts. This is my, by the way, my interpretation. These are not their words. Um, and so here, what you have is uh, a stairs, which climbs the whole height of that floor and which is also used as a reading room for the library. And then it's, um, if you look back, this is the view you have. And uh, this space doubles as library, cafeteria, and canteen. And then if you walk around it, uh, it, it works like a spiral and extends throughout the building as, uh, as I said, a library. Um, so studded ceiling is uh, a striking char characteristic about it. And interestingly, to my surprise, the architects had no uh, explicit explanation which they offered to me. I have read in the press that they um, sometimes they mentioned the, sh the shield of St. George, who is on the crest of this city called Amersfoort. Um, I personally think it has annotations, connotations with punk. Um, and perhaps it reminds also uh, uh, other things. So for them, architecture is not really always sim symbolic. In fact, it is very rarely symbolic. Now, here is perhaps a best known building. It is uh, the so-called MAS, the mass in Antwerp. Um, and it is partly a museum, but I th which is contained in the um, uh, stone clad parts and partly uh, a belvedere, in other words, a spiral which ascends right to the top of the building for the benefit of the public. Um, here it is worth mentioning that there is in this building and in a limited extent in the work of the practice, a debt to Omar and Rem Core House. Neutlings actually did work in the very early days with Rem Core House. Um, and there is some borrowing, of course, a spiral perhaps has a, a bearing with the Jussieu competition, which Core House did in Paris. 
Um, and the curved glass, which has been used for the, uh, the, the Belvedere part of the building, uh, draws um, from the Casa de la Musica, where it was first used. So here in a much more uh, grander, and I should say much more useful uh, way. Um, now, one comparison which the architects make with this building, and I think it is significant, is that they compare this building as in fact it did the competition for uh, the concert hall in Bruges to the uh, medieval belfries, which was built in, um, in places like um, Antwerp and Bruges and pretty much all cities in um, Belgium or in what was called Flanders at the time. This is to underline their commitment to uh, a public vocation of their work and um, a popular vocation. I show you a couple of pictures from the inside. This is a picture I'm very fond of. Uh, this is a man who um, climbed um, the, uh, the Belvedere very broad stairs with also uh, escalators and is contemplating the view of Antwerp and with uh, the River Rhine. Uh, this space was initially meant to be open very late from, um, if I remember well, 10 o'clock to until uh, 10 o'clock at night. So in other words, to be used as very much uh, an extension of the space of the city. Nowadays, whether for COVID reason or another, this has been reduced. Uh, another picture with more recent, which I took and where see uh, here it has, so building has been invested by students to do their work uh, with the benefit of the view and perhaps the benefit of company and also being away from the conventional environment of universities. Uh, a, a third um, building uh, is the so-called Rosette Cultural Center. This is again in the center, center east of the Netherlands uh, in Arnhem. And this one is mainly a library. And like the cultural center, which I have shown before, it uh, it's it is based on a monumental stairs, which I, you can see is rising on the edge of the building. And not only that, having reached that point, it is then returning and rising for the rest of the build, the rest of the lengths of the building going the other way. And so another organ of sort. Um, here is a picture of these stairs from the bottom. And, this, and the stairs is literally the main space of the building. Um, it exhibits some rather corpulent details, uh, which again is a characteristic which reminds me of uh, the work of Sterling. And the practical reason for this very beefy detail is that it is there to resist the invasion of leaflets, placards, posters, displays, etc., which uh, uh, one commonly sees in buildings of this kind, by which resist, not resist because they're obviously there, but uh, make sure that there was a right, a right relationship between the architecture and the way it is used. And if one goes up to the end of the stairs I showed you, these which look over that stairs and also uh, towards the view and which are the main study spaces or uh, carols or uh, which one expects in some libraries. And the last of the four I will show um, is um, a building which has been completed relatively recently, 2016. And it's, an, it's a town hall of the city of Deventer to the uh, northeast east of the Netherlands. Um, and 
the Serre architecture has evolved over the years, and in a way, it has become less monumental, which is and less object oriented, which is partly the kind of commissions they have been receiving. And here you have uh, a new building, the town hall, which is uh, an inset into the existing historical part of the fabric of Deventer, and, but nevertheless includes this building. And whereas the architects both built the, the new build part as well as refurbished, and I think refurbished very well, uh, these buildings which were uh, adjoining. So it's a very much a mixed commission. And if you walk through the arcade here, uh, you have a courtyard again with existing buildings, this one's freestanding, and, and then here, of course, uh, more town hall, which is town hall as well. And if you walk through this arcade here, uh, this is what you see with the main reception desk here and an arcade, which leads to a shortcut right through the building. So it's a shortcut through the city, perhaps another comparison which could be made with, for instance, uh, the Stats Gallery in uh, Stuttgart and uh, a main space for people um, who actually use the town hall here. Um, now, another theme which I was to mention briefly, um, Neitling's Red Ike were used to making um, this kind of drawing for every project they did. And uh, they very clearly, and I know, they actually borrowed from the convention of comics, as a way comics are being drawn. But what actually to me is interesting about those drawings and what they implied is that these forms are not meant to be symbolic in any way. They are not, in other words, postmodernist. I think it would be wrong to say that the work of Neutling's Redyck is postmodernist. And to me, this is um, one of many instances of their work uh, exp uh, expressing itself through body language, very much in the same way we refer to people expressing themselves uh, through their body language. Um, and to illustrate that, um, and I don't do this arbitrarily, um, see uh, Neutlings and Redyke are formed of comic strips. And in fact, they say that they much prefer see drawings of comic strips than they do the uh, architectural drawings. And in fact, I have never heard them talk about architectural drawings. And the reason for their preference, uh, many, many reasons one could mention, but perhaps the main reason for this preference is to do with them finding these drawings are, are full of emotions and also full of liveliness in the way an architectural drawing could never be. Um, and here is another example. Um, and for those who um, are familiar with comic strip or with Tintin, they will recognize in spite of the cow head, uh, the Captain Haddock. Um, but what interests me here is uh, all the extraneous piece around the body and the other clouds and the dashes here and uh, the spirals, which uh, there were more on the previous slides and the stars. And these were called by actually a, a graphic, I mean, a, a comic strip designer. So they were given the name of Emanata, Emanata, and this word has actually stayed. Now, Emanata uh, 
I think, a nice word because in a way it, it embodies the kind of vitality which the architects would like to give to their buildings. But if one, you know, think freely about a manata, it brings to mind, for instance, mana, the mana of poly, poly, um, pollinations. And here we are back into the field of animism. Uh, and also we perhaps think of anima, which means of course, soul. And we perhaps also think of animations and perhaps a desire of making animate forms. Now, um, the architects, and this is more recent, have become uh, concerned with uh, ideas of identity. And this is one of the early examples where on the facades of the mass, the building which I showed before, uh, they um, first designed this uh, aluminium uh, element, which you uh, actually, aluminium or okay, stainless steel, I cannot remember which. Um, and these are based on chocolates, which are produced in Antwerp, traditional chocolates. Uh, enlarged and the architects um, produce them in such a way that inhabitants of the city of Antwerp could uh, buy for so many euros one of those hands as a way of expressing their, of manifesting rather their sponsorship of the buildings. Uh, there are about 3,000 of those. Uh, another uh, evident concerns for identity, this is again the city hall in Deventer. Um, there are in this case 2,000 plus uh, fingerprints on the building. Um, and those were actually uh, commissions and or I worked with an artist. This is uh, an intermediate stage for one of these patterns. And so they asked volunteers who wanted to uh, uh, donate, so to speak, their fingerprints and the fingerprints that were numbered so that people knew where it was. Um, and the idea here, I think in all, I have said up until now is a desire to make a popular architecture. And ultimately, this is what interests me. It is a desire which architects had of making a popular architecture, which in a way doesn't, at least doesn't necessarily have recourse to architectural conventions. Um, and this image also remind me of this one. I could have chosen others, um, where there is traditionally a connection between uh, hands and the, sac the sacred. And you remember, for instance, the, uh, the wall in Jerusalem or the Kaaba in Mecca and one could think of many examples where people um, put their hands on a building as a manifestation, an expression of respect. Um, another interest, um, or another thing which one could point out in Neutling's Relax building is uh, affinities with tattoos. And in fact, they have written about tattoos. Uh, here is, I think, a beautiful uh, photograph of a man uh, from the Fulani tribe in Nigeria. And maybe one can see an affinity between these graffitis and uh, these uh, details of the competition in Bruges, 
Oh, here I meant to imitate the lace in Bruges, which is a production there, but uh, I think this is not uh, maybe what is really relevant. Um, what this project actually reminds me of, and I have uh, almost finished, uh, is a word which was said by uh, Diaghilev to Cocteau. Uh, Diaghilev, and this is actually very famous and many of you will know it. Diaghilev said to Cocteau, to an advice to a young man, he said, Eton moi, which means surprise me. Um, and it has a stronger meaning in France. And the meaning is to shock and to please. I think this building does this or would have done this uh, had it been built. And I must say that I find that the architecture in recent years, uh, this ability, this, I mean, this freedom, uh, which is so clearly there in the work of Neutling Friedrich about uh, the use or the role of imagination in architecture has been to some extent undermined uh, for reasons that one could actually discuss. Um, um, I name. think this is really all I ah, want perfect. to say. Yeah. You were going to say I should stop now. I wasn't. No, I wasn't. <laughs> 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 no, but I was, I was, I was anxious that John um, uh, come in, and this is perfect timing. So, um, John, do you need to share your screen? No, Merit, I don't need the screen because uh, the Irene has the images, and I'm happy with that. Wonderful. But maybe I don't need to keep the images unless you want them back on. Well, I think people won't forget those images, Irene. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Merit, would you like me to respond and then we could yeah, discuss? Yeah, please, please go ahead. The floor is yours, yes. Well, I have the advantage over some of the audience because I was sent Irene's essay totems in advance of this session. So my briefing was to read the essay and think of how to respond in advance of having seen the argument. So if you don't mind, I have a kind of four part response. And if you can put up with a small, you know, 10 minutes reading, then we might have a discussion, if that's all right with you. Perfect. So let me start by talking about the essay. I really enjoy the way that Irene has written about his work in his essay, Totems. I like the way he thinks about and teases out his thinking and takes the trouble to write properly about how we can view architecture. So in this essay, he says that Neutlings really see their work as totemic sculpture. I mean, you've just heard him discuss all of that. And he tells us a story about the theft or appropriation of a totem pole, the pole that's known as the chief of all women and how it was stolen from Alaska after a hundred years in its native village and now proudly displayed in Seattle another hundred years later removed completely from its original meaning and purpose, but appreciated as an ornament in the city. So I think he says that the totem itself is an autonomous force, and by that inference, so too the works of the Dutch architects could be understood to be free of reference and punched through by their totemic power. Words like punch, punchy, pugnacious, are sprinkled through the essay. And even on the poster for today's event, I see the word punk, which has connotations of punching, has come through. Now, Aaron Betsky, who's the promoter of all things Dutch, critic, curator, one-time client of Neutlings Riedek, discusses their work as bordering on the limits of kitsch. Irene refers to surrealist imagery in his essay to Max Ernst elephant, to imperial assertiveness, that would be to Napoleon's Bastille elephant. And even today in his discussion, he talks about elephants again, 
Underlying all this, I suspect, is a kind of inclination towards an ironical stance, or perhaps an inclination to upend received notions of taste, a questioning of a cosy consensus, maybe, especially in the post Lossian discussion of architectural ornamentation, and to antagonize the narrow definition of good taste. But these solid objects of Neukling's Riedig, the totems that Irene discusses so elegantly, they seem boomingly hollow to me. These architects are at pains to deny that architecture is an art. Architects solve problems, they say. Artists don't have problems to solve. That's what I'm quoting there. But then, without missing a beat, they go on to discuss the importance of the sculptural power of each of their buildings. So now we're in sculpture, no longer in art. Their early work, as has just been concluded, uh, was presented in cartoonish drawings. And I'm afraid that's still how I understand their buildings. That's my problem with this position, a problem I have with irony and kitsch. And maybe it's what lies behind my response um, to what he's saying today. So the second part is a little bit of background to my understanding of Irene Scalbert. I first, we first met in the early 90s when he was teaching at the AA. And we discussed a few times our shared enthusiasm for the solidified space of Starling's Leicester building. Um, I remember, in fact, I have it close by me, the early essay called Cerebral Functionalism that was his writing about Leicester, published, as I recall, in 1993, which is 30 years after the completion of Leicester and about 30 years ago today. And in this typically perceptive and deeply researched essay, Irene refers to Sterling having been influenced by Moretti's casting of the volumes of church interiors, negative space cast in solid plaster. And he quotes Sterling as saying, if space can be imagined as solid mass, determined in shape and size by the proportion of a room or the function of a corridor, then an architectural solution could be perceived by the consideration of alternative ways in which the various elements of the program could be plastically assembled, which of course is Sterling's architectural manifesto, summarized. Now, Aldo van Eyck, as I recall, uh, and one of the identified enemies of the Kohlhaas crowd, and we'll have more on this later, Aldo van Eyck used to complain that Sterling's Leicester was a solid teapot. He criticized its volumetric elemental composition saying that all those elegant shapes were about as useful as a solid teapot, uh, that is to say, useless, useless formalism. Well, I, I wouldn't agree with Aldo van Eyck, and neither would Neutlings, and neither would Irene, who concluded most poetically in that essay that Leicester presents a fragile paradox. He saw it as a Trojan horse of postmodernism with form and function working off each other in a new and liberating way. So as you can imagine, we all have a lot in common. So now for a little bit of my background or my understanding of Neuklings and Reading. This is the third of four parts, Merit don't <laughs> um, We're the same generation as Neuklings Reading, me and my cohort, but we grew up on opposite sides. Their postmodernism is, I think, post-OMA. And ours, I think, is in continuity with the values of European critical practice. We don't do irony. Interestingly, for today's purposes, uh, we, Sheila and I, actually once worked on opposite sides in the M plane in Amersfoort, their cultural center uh, on one side, our apartment cluster on the other, opposite sides of the same Wallace Wilson master plan. Theirs was built, ours not yet, still waiting to be built. But I'm asking myself 
What's the substantial difference between one kind of architect and another, since both sides would share a common enemy in the commercialized global world? So reading about their practice in preparation for this event, I often felt I could participate, fully participate, in the discussion within their design process, right, just with different results in mind. Aaron Betsky, writing about their work, describes their approach as plain weirdness, an architecture of the everyday that makes room for the beauties of the strangeness of art. And I felt a kind of a cold, a kind of creeping cold coming over me and reading this as if my clothes had been stolen because I've often described our own ambition for a feeling of strangely familiar in architecture. So plain weirdness versus strangely familiar, it turns out we have plenty of common ground. So like me, Neuglings, and I'm quoting from him here, like me, Neuglings wants a relationship with materials. He wants walls that you can touch. He wants to do buildings with character in volumetrics and materials. He wants a relationship between building and the city. He works hard to keep parts of the building open all the time to public access. He wants a relationship between public buildings and public space. He says that in his early days, perhaps dating from when he was working with ONA, he used to reject the idea that architecture can transform society, but now he's, he's come around to the possibility of the transformative role of architecture in society. And like me, Neuglings really don't want a uniform, globalized, glass skin, icons with spectacular silhouettes disguising internal conformity. And they don't want the end of our vanity as we know it. And again, all these are quotes from them. So you might say we would have so much in common. And we would, if it wasn't for their buildings. It's possible I really like the work of Neuglings reading. I would like it a lot better if I didn't have to look at it or be in it. Or perhaps, how shall I put it? I'd like it better if it wasn't so Dutch. And this, this is a much wider problem, which goes back to their origin. I mean, they came straight out of the kitchen of the cold house of Rem Kohlhaas. Kohlhaas, the hit and run driver. Kohlhaas, the careless. Okay, the fourth part of my response. I'm just picking an example, one I know because I visited it with clients, my own clients. I visited it anyway, and I, you know, had admired it from afar. So let's talk about the mass in Antwerp, the luxuriantly stone-clad, curvy glass spiral, museum on the strome. These 10 stacked storage boxes arranged in a continuous uh, climbing spiral are sometimes discussed as being evocative of the Pompidou Center in Paris by Piano and Rogers or the Guggenheim in New York by Frank Lloyd Wright. But in my opinion, they are not equivalent. They're not up there with those masterworks. I don't see synthesis in that work, only separation. But covered over in red, tiles as it is, and with a glass skin vertical circulation as it has, some might say that Sterling's Leicester might be likewise comparable to the mass, which I actually think Irene just did, but I haven't expected him to do. But in any case, I wouldn't agree. The spectacular, unpeeling, escalator-fueled spiral of the mass in Antwerp does not lead anywhere. I began to think of it as a no place distributor road, like a ring road bypass encircling a pedestrianized town center. You have to get off at a roundabout to get into town. There's no integration in this separation. Each of the museum floors in the mosque are paid to enter. And weirdly, in this apparently logic driven diagram, there are no stopping points, no in between. You're either in or you're out. 
toilets are on the ground floor. Lifts, that, which are necessary in the building, lifts run entirely within the security zone of the isolated museum floors. So if you change your mind halfway up the spiral, decide to see an exhibit, want a coffee, to want to visit a toilet, it's back down 10 floors of the escalator and start all over again. The spectacle of the winding stair is a powerful image, but it's not a substantial space enhancing human experience. It's a brand identifying logo for the museum. And that's what I mean by hollow. So in many of their buildings, I think you find a similarly abrupt break in materials, a disruptive diagrammatic differential between typological categories, a disjunctive rupture in spatial experience. So here's the big difference. We like to explore the in-between, the integration of the space in between, what the Japanese call the ma, moving between inside and outside, oscillating on a delayed threshold. In my ideal architecture, you're always on the inside, even when you're outside, and vice versa. And I just don't find this empathy in the work discussed today. Okay. Thank you. Um, that, that, let me just come in there for just one moment, Erin. Yes, um, uh, because I think, uh, first of all, we're just going to allow this to run slightly over time because I haven't been very good at um, keeping time. Um, so, so I apologize for that. But um, I also wanted to say that, uh, let me just say that it's a rare privilege uh, to have two people speak so clearly about something and articulate a kind of disagreement um, so plainly. And I think that this is uh, actually uh, a wonderful thing to uh, to witness and to hear and to be a part of. So I, I first of all, I'd just like to, to say that and to thank you both for that, because I think it's, um, it's unusual. And uh, particularly in today's culture of uh, a kind of uh, tribalistic agreement with something or something else and discussion seems to be um, entirely lacking. So I, I think this is also the reason that I think we should continue on for a few more minutes. So um, if I could uh, uh, maybe invite uh, you both to uh, uh, to discuss this a little bit now. Irene, I understand that you wanted to jump in, so I will allow you to do just that now. <laughs> Um, and I've also well, asked. I haven't, I haven't yet expressed my disagreement. Uh, <laughs> well, that's that's also the case. <laughs> well, there, there are many points. Which uh, I mean, by the way, thank you very much, John, for uh, preparing this uh, very thoughtful and taking uh, response and taking the time to actually do the research to do this. And I, I think that is. Uh, a great thing to do, and for especially for some somebody like you who's very busy. So I'm grateful for this. Um, now, um, so there are a number of things which I could mention, and I hope they are based on uh, a, a position or knowledge, rather, which I have acquired as I was doing this work and maybe other things too. Um, now. I think that the, the main impulse of these architects is that they want, they are not interested in being uh, part of the, the, the mainstream of architectural thinking and of defining a place in that respect. They told me, for instance, that they very rarely visit architectural buildings in their leisure, which took me by surprise because most of my friends do. Um, I, uh, so their work, in other words, has no particular reference. Um, and they want to actually bring a different culture in architecture and a culture which uh, consists of things that interest them. For instance, comic. I think their love of comics is genuine. I also think that their desire to actually make an architecture which appeals 
directly to the public, if I may say so, above the shoulder of architects, is genuine. And I find it uh, interesting. Certainly, I find it a worthwhile line to pursue. They actually um, uh, talk about maximalism, uh, by which would be their position, as opposed to the minimalism, which would be the, the position of many of their peers, uh, notably in Belgium. In other words, that everything in architecture is possible. Um, I don't think their work is kitsch. Uh, I think that their, their every decision they make in terms of uh, decoration, for instance, is done not in the second degree, as maybe one says in French, but it is a first degree response. It is based on things which they like. Uh, I don't also see their work as ironical. I think that, except in rare circumstances, I think there is no irony in their work. And as I said earlier, I don't think that their work is postmodern in any way, because what defines um, Postmodernism, to my mind, is that uh, the architecture of postmodernism is symbolic. And their work is not symbolic, except in a very reduced way. Uh, for instance, the hands and the fingerprints, which I was uh, mentioning, which draws from emblems of the city. Could I interrupt? Please. Because I'm, I'm afraid you may be restating points that you made in your compelling introduction. Um, and I wondered if I may, just to get behind the red line of any difference, because of course we're friends. Um, I wanted to ask you whether, here we are in, you know, in an Irish School of Architecture context. I just wonder whether your espousal of these guys is a cover for another kind of antagonism that you might feel. I just wanted to ask you, do you think Irish architecture is too pro Caesar, pro Frampton to be healthy? I, no, well, I wouldn't go as far as saying that Irish architecture is not healthy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I find that much uh, architecture in Ireland is conventional, is drawing from a very limited and strictly architectural uh, inheritance. And there, 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 there are certain figures which have been um, coming again and again in architectural discussion in Ireland, which uh, are a kind of established territory where architects in Ireland can go. For instance, Caesar, for instance, uh, Le Corbusier, for instance, Sterling, and, and we can, of course. And to be frank, I mean, I find this uh, disposition, certainly I see when I see it as a, as a teacher, I find it limiting and I find it limiting notably in respect to uh, what I would like to see as the free imagination of students. Yeah. In a way you see that's, that's what I wanted to get to because there's no point you and me really arguing over Neutlings. Yes. <laughs> or, or even arguing over ornament in a way. Yeah. But I thought it would be really good to get to this point that we might agree about imagination. Yeah. And I thought I'd love you to just speak about imagination in architecture without talking about, you know, borders. <laughs> Then maybe I can come back to the last slide <laughs> and to what Diaghilev talked to Cocteau. 
uh, said to Cocteau, you know, uh, astonish me essentially. Well, uh, I mean, I think that's certainly in the first stage, it would be very unwise to establish boundaries to somebody's imagination uh, as an architect. My view would be that uh, imagination in design should be without borders in the first instance. And then if we are in the in a real world situation, surrounded by constraints, etc., uh, then we need to take those things into account. But I, I wouldn't say that the architectural imagination, architectural theory, the things one really cared for should be actually negotiated from day one with the real world around oneself. Otherwise, I think this is a recipe for rehearsing certain position, uh, perhaps uh, more often, more regularly than would be wise. So I, I am very much in, in, in favor of the designer to be free at the outset, yes. And that to me is perhaps, you know, you having used the word authenticity would be uh, at least a part guarantee to the authenticity of the word. That's the basis, so the foundation of that project would have an authenticity based on what somebody really thinks and really wants to achieve. But does it not does it not worry you? I mean, I was astonished when you said that Nuglings really really very rarely visit buildings in their leisure, you know, as if I began to get an image of them eating up the ground they stand on themselves and having less and less culture, you know, to make their work from. And it's also weird to me to hear you who so much researches into architectural history to start championing architects who pretend to have no interest in architectural history. How, how does that not leave you out? Well, the, so you that, I mean, maybe in some ways, but let's think. Uh, the, the bets which uh, people like Neutlings Riedeck, but there would be others one could think of, would be that one can make architecture with sources which are non-architectural, for instance, comics. Yeah. And this won't be the first time it happened in history. After all, I mean, yeah. we, can, we can think of modern, modern architects thinking much better of engineering than they did of architecture. I mean, uh, how far can one go from the art of architecture as it had been I want, I want uh, us to draw on the wider world. I really do not want to argue for narrow-minded, in-the-box architecture. But I'm just amazed that you would leave the history of architecture out, you know, um, well, it, I mean, it, it turned out contradictory. I mean, I'm interested in all kinds of things. There are many <laughs> architects I like. I mean, don't forget that I, I, I have spent a lot of time with the Leicester Engineering Building, and I have mm. spent a lot of time looking at many buildings carefully. And I am interested in, in many architects' positions and attitude. And I myself have visited, as my students only reminded me at the AA two days ago, I have visited literally hundreds of buildings. Uh, yeah. But can I ask? Um, can I ask just a, something that occurs to me listening uh, to the discussion is, um, which is quite interesting, is that in some ways, what we're discussing is 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 something around the notion of starting points or origins, and what what are the origins of an architecture? And um, I think Steph actually raised an interesting question in the chat around 
Um, and I think John, you were referring to this also, the kind of participation in European culture uh, versus the participation in national culture. And um, the suggestion of Irene, your, your reading of the Neutling's Vedic work is that there's something uh, populist and you know slightly, and I think John, you're also kind of casting it as maybe slightly uh, nationalist, ick, not in a kind of political sense, but in a sense of ter territory, i.e., um, Belgium, um, and or uh, and and thinking around a, a kind of pedagogical territory around Rem Koolhaas and Dutch architecture, um, which you know serves as sort of like moments of uh, or, or serves to draw boundaries and borders around things. Um, and if we talk, if we talk about starting points and origins in in, in architecture particularly today, um, it seems as if you know we're both you're both describing in a way. Well, where where's the best starting point? What is the best you know kind of place to begin? And I think particularly for students who you know might be uh, listening to this or participating in this, this is a question that you know, uh, with maybe without them even knowing it. Is constantly on the table. Um, you know, is constantly on the table. In fact, this is the most important thing to put on the table, so that when they graduate um, and move on, it doesn't go off the table. Um, and I, I think that this is a kind of a, 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 you know, an interesting point. And for me, it crystallized a little bit when you both brought up uh, the same building. Maybe unknowingly, I don't know, John, if you knew that Irene was going to talk about the Leicester Engineering. Uh, project by Sterling, I didn't know either, but it, it kind of struck me because the project is obviously seminal in many, many ways, but also it strikes me as a kind of common starting point, um, which then goes in very, very different directions as far as possibly mm -hmm. conclusions that could be drawn from it. But I think this question of origin is important. Um, yeah. I mean, the question of origins in the way is based on something which is deeply personal, at least one hopes so, and which, uh, which serves as a foundation of one um, sensibility, sensibility both intellectually and, and otherwise. Um, and of course, this is part of our architectural training and training more generally to actually try to get to the fore of this. Um, and I mean, for me, for instance, Jean Cocteau, whom I mentioned at the end, was very formative when I was in my third year. So I remember that comment, and these comments still served when I need, as a, as a guidance. But I, 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 I must say, I find, and this is coming back to um, John's point, that the starting point in architecture, and perhaps including in the School of Architecture today, is perhaps too strictly architectural. It doesn't necessarily ask questions which are broad enough. It is too much about the architectural tradition in the formal sense without necessarily raising the question which personally I would consider to be paramount, which is what is architecture for and also for who architecture is. And I think this, especially this last question is one which interests me at the moment and it is one which I find Nightlings would like have an interesting point of view on. In other words, they start with the position that their building with all its eccentricity is making a bid for it identification. It's a bit like a politician standing on the platform and making a bid for somehow the es es espousal, espousal of a certain view. And that I find very interesting. Um, so I might say, Merit, just since you asked us both that question about origins, mm. 
that, and I realized this is a wonderful kind of moment of clarity that came up when Irene said that they don't visit buildings for their leisure. Um, I, 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 I would say that an architect who doesn't read and who doesn't listen to music and who doesn't read poetry and doesn't look at art is not working with their brain in the way that an architect should. But I think the origins of architecture is in architecture and that we the architects carry responsibility for all the architecture that's ever been made through our understanding. So even if, you know, even if you cut my arms off and told me I could no longer draw and closed down my office and told me I could no longer practice, I would still look at architecture every day. You know, I think the origins, and I think the way a student should look at architecture, no matter how old it is, no matter how dead the architect is, you should look at every work they find as if it's alive and fresh and new in the mind of the architect who made it and the architect who's looking at it now. And then it's alive. So you mustn't think about architecture as history or style or, or, or uh, opposites. You have to think about the feeling of the experience and you have to train, you have to practice the feeling of the experience of understanding buildings through what they are trying to tell you, how they are trying to communicate to you across space, across time, across structure, across material. And you have to receive that into yourself so that you can carry that responsibility for all the buildings that have ever been built across all time in you. I mean, I, I hear you and I, I think I agreed up, up to a point. Uh, I mean, personally, of course, as a, as a critic, as a historian, I cannot ignore the architecture of the past. But I think our responsibility, if anything, is even, is even greater as far as the future is concerned. Um, and our responsibility to the future consists, among many other things, in extending, in other words, renewing this tradition which is in the past. Uh, in other words, you know, I think it is only something which belongs in the relatively res recent history of architecture that we um, think of architecture in terms of reference, in terms of what other people have been doing in the past. And well, perhaps I, I, I come back to the example of modernists, of modernists who quite uh, deliberately decided to look to the future rather than to the past and look specifically at the work of engineers whom they thought was well ahead of what the profession had to, to offer at, at that particular moment. Having said this, my own answer to that question uh, would be, and I'm not sure I remember the, the exact quote, but uh, Alberti said something to the effect that we must not spoil what uh, uh, has been done in the past, and we must make sure that we don't curtail the possibility of what should be done in the future. At the moment, when I think we are living in a rather conservative architectural environment, uh, I must say I am more sensitive, more, uh, more attentive to people who are looking towards renewing the profession. And not least because I think the issue which the profession is facing at the moment are not only diverse and perhaps they have always been, but they're also very urgent. And it is quite unlikely that some of the things we face as a profession at the moment can be uh, met with answers which are part of the stock in, in trade, what Nightlings with I would call the 
the toolbox, with respect, incidentally, the toolbox of the architecture profession. Um, so I would say, because um, I know that Merit is going to shut us up, I would, I would say that, with regret, despite anything you said today, I would still continue to read your essays with curiosity. <laughs> And I would also say that um, I think somehow we share this um, frustration, this desire for imagination. To me, this is a really powerful message and a really important thing to say about keeping the door open to imagination. Definitely. Um, but I'm not going down the road of your direction in this regard, I'm not going to join you in championing, being the champion of those, of those architects. No, I can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad that, that we haven't accomplished too much today. Um, <laughs>